From Microbe TV, this is Twin, This Week in Neuroscience, episode number 22, recorded on September 27th, 2021. <laughs> Vincent Rack and Yellow, and you're listening to the podcast all about the nervous system. Joining me today from San Francisco, Ori Lieberman. Hello, Vincent. How are you? Very well. Getting it to fall here. Temperature dropping. So it the is same there, I guess, right? It's literally the same temperature it's been since June when I got here. So <laughs> the, le the leaves aren't changing. It's still foggy and moist. It's very nice. strange here. Yeah. Also joining us from Salt Lake City, Jason Shepard. Hey, Vincent. Good to be back. From here in New York, Tim Chung. Oh, he's frozen. <laughs> in a funny face. He froze. Look at that. <laughs> gotta get, he's got to get off Wi-Fi. Uh, all right. Well, let's, let's get him back. And from Nashville, Tennessee, Vivian Morrison. Hi, everyone. Hey, Vivian. <laughs> now, now Tim is gone. <laughs> uh, this is a momentous occasion. It was the first podcast recorded at the Incubator, our new digs in New York City. Congratulations. Hey, Tim, you're back. You were frozen when I welcomed you. Welcome, Tim. Thank you very much. I, I forgot, to, <laughs> forgot to mention in the pre-show, I might be cutting, I might cut off at about 4.30 because NYU suffered Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it suffered something. Uh, yeah. Yeah, they're suffering. Right. You should come here. He's like he's like eight blocks away from me, frankly, just across <laughs> town. He could walk here. Mm. Hope you don't have to reboot. But um, anyway, hopefully things are okay. But I might, I might, um, I hope you guys yeah. can hear me okay with the internet. Um, yeah. Hey, Tim, what are those things on the, behind you that are yeah. rotating? Yeah, they're following you. Ooh, they just turn off the power. Um, sorry, what thing rotating behind me? Underneath oh. the big screen behind you, they were moving. Oh, those are cameras. So this this is a fancy, <laughs> yeah, I'm being spied on. This is a fancy NYU conference room where you can actually have a group of people sitting on the table and do uh, teleconference with someone else. And they would, nice. depending on which microphone is being activated by which speaker, the camera would track the person. Whoa. It is some fancy, fancy stuff, yeah. That's cool. We have something called the owl, which is like this thing in the middle of the, uh, you can put on the table mm -hmm. and it rotates depending on who speaks. It somehow detects the direction. So that's pretty cool too. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, that, it was very strange. I guess when the power goes off, they reorient, right? Right, exactly. It just rebooted, yeah. I was saying, Tim, um, it, someday you can just come here. It's just to, I'm on 30th Street and 7th Avenue. You're hardly, you're cross town basically, right? Yep, that's true. Yeah, one day I would, yeah, I'd love to come oh, over I, and cross town with my little mic. And especially, especially if the uh, power keeps going out at NYU because they don't have money after <laughs> buying out all those fancy uh, conference rooms. Right? <laughs> exactly. All right, folks, uh, we have a paper for you today, and uh, I'm going to hand it over to Ori to tell us all about it. Cool. So um, we have a paper and we can also talk broadly about um, this entity in neuroscience called perineoplastic disorders. Um, and so I don't know if you guys ever watched House, um, mm. but <laughs> in House, there was always this mantra that, oh, it's never lupus. They would always have this kind of like crazy diagnostic journey and it was never lupus. Um, because lupus is an uh, autoimmune disease that can affect any organ and can manifest in any way. And you know, even even today, when we're in on rounds, lupus is always on the diagnostic on the differential diagnosis list. Um, but mm. it's never it's never lupus. Mm. Um, but lupus is a very interesting disease. Um, and mostly affects women of childbearing age. Um, it is uh, really kind of life limiting and has a pretty high mortality rate. Um, where with something like 70% survival after 10 years of the disease. Um, and classically, you can affect the kidneys, um, the pancreas. Um, and then also uh, what is becoming more and more realized is that there's a spectrum of neuropsychiatric disorders that are associated with, uh, lu with lupus. Um, and a lot of work is being put into understanding 
what the kind of mechanism and treatment potential is for these neuropsychiatric disorders associated with lupus. Um, and we'll talk about a paper today after we kind of go through some background um, where they've highlighted one mechanism through which you can have neuropsychiatric dysfunction in lupus. Um, so, so what is lupus? So, you know, it's, it's kind of this nebulous disease entity um, where there is a increased immune response to autoantigens. Um, so normally our body um, has immune cells that and, and others on this podcast, including Vincent, will know more about this, but where they react to foreign invaders. So, for example, bacteria or viruses, um, but they don't react to self antigens. And um, this is kind of uh, has been worked out very thoroughly um, where cell T and B cells, which are immune cells um, that um, are that react to self antigens are actually cleared from the body and are not allowed to further propagate and, le and initiate immune responses to self antigens. Um, but in some autoimmune diseases, um, this process fails and you get essentially maturation and activation of B or and or T cells that um, essentially guide the body's immune system to react against known self antigens. Um, and what these antigens are is are kind of widely variant and um, I think in some ways are I, I, when I started reading for this podcast, I thought that, okay, there would be one specific antigen that would be really important in each disease, but it seems like it's actually more just a lack of immune tolerance in general. And whatever the autoantigen is, is kind of a sec, like is um, there can be many different autoantigens that lead to, lead to these, lead to disease. Tim, do you have a question? You look. Um, so are you talking about specifically for lupus or all autoimmune disease that involves antibody? Uh, so in lupus in particular, but also, for example, like Sjogren's and there are others, there are characteristic autoantibodies or autoantigens. Um, but in general, the process that is like the pathophysiologic mechanism of the disease is a lack of tolerance um, to self. But, it, but it's also true that there's common self antigens so there's particular proteins for sure that pop up in in diseases and in some cases it's clear why those particular uh proteins will elicit a response so for example in this case um you have a receptor that's on the surface of a cell so that's sticking out so that's pretty easy for um the antibodies to detect it and then oftentimes there's misexpression of proteins so um, if you have proteins that are normally expressed in the brain, but now suddenly they're expressed um, outside the brain, that's another trigger. Um, and there's a lot of sort of paraneoplastic syndromes that are caused by cancers that can make um, proteins that are, you know, in excess of what they're normally expressed at and also just not normally expressed outside of certain uh, organs. So I think there's there are themes there, but I, I think what you're alluding to is that the trigger, like why the immune system isn't working or is, is not clearing out these self antigens is, is often, un, you know, not really known. So let, let's dive deeper into like the cancer induced perineoplastic disorders. I think that they provide a nice paradigm. Um, so, so this work has been done really over the last like two decades, um, pioneered by this guy, Joseph Dalmo, who's a neurologist at Penn. Um, and what he has has really demonstrated is that in certain uh, cancers, there are antibodies that are formed against uh, proteins that are expressed by the cancer itself that then cross react to normal brain proteins, for example, the NMDA receptor, which we'll talk about more here, um, and lead to a neurologic syndrome um, that can range from psychosis to difficulty walking or ataxia. Um, and calming of the immune res of the immune response with essentially anti inflammatory agents can actually correct this neurologic syndrome. And this has really been a game changer um, in neurology, because all of a sudden, all of these people who kind of didn't fit the age or demographic of a primary psychiatric disorder that present with psychiatric symptoms, um, now have some treatable kind of uh, disease. Um, and these are these paraneoplastic syndromes. Um, and a lot of times, um, these will, 
essentially be lead to lead towards a kind of a diagnostic journey um, to find an underlying cancer. So you can actually have the primary presentation of a cancer be the psychiatric syndrome. Um, you then figure out that there's antibodies in the blood um, towards one of your CNS proteins. Um, and then you go on this search for a cancer that might even be so... Oh, no. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> um, well, we've lost Ori. <laughs> um, yeah, these, these, these cancers are rare, but it's interesting. So as Ori was saying, like, oftentimes these people don't know they have cancer. They have these neurological symptoms. And so they come, that's why they come into the, the clinic. And it's then only after sort of ruling out some things that they get to the point where um, they they do there are some common proteins that you can screen in the blood or antibodies you can screen in the blood, um, and and then the, that di- that that is diagnostic of the cancer itself, which is pretty cool. Is there any relationship between like so I, I between the kind of stage of the cancer and the these symptoms arising? Because it kind of seems it seems interesting that you would first have these neurological symptoms, but not necessarily, well, it might be difficult to desist, to differentiate between these, but not necessarily have like the extreme weight loss or fatigue or some of the other more classic hallmarks, hallmarks of cancer. Yeah. I mean, maybe Ori knows that he's back, Ori. Um, but I would say it, it seems quite, quite common that um, the neurological symptoms are sort of predate the real severe cancer symptoms Mm. um i know for so the reason why i kind of know a little bit about this is that my lab is actually working on one of the families of genes that are um common which i I aptly called pnma genes which are paraneoplastic antigen genes um because they related to this memory gene that we've been working on and actually we think we've discovered potentially why this set of genes encode proteins that can be antigenic is because they form capsids. Um, but anyway, that's a, that's a, a side note. But um, for a long time, people, there's a lot of um, these self-antigens that are intracellular proteins, and it's not clear why you would get a response to an intracellular protein. The NMDA receptor is common because it is on the outside of the cell, and so it comes into contact with the T cells and B cells. Um, but, but there's certain kinds of cancers that are associated with specific um, genes that, that are common for some of these disorders. So it's, it's not like just any cancer. It's certainly di- and so that's why actually the, they can be diagnostic if there's an antibody against specific proteins that's diagnostic of the kind of cancer usually that, that um, is, is there. But I'm Jason, curious. Go- oh, go, go ahead, ahead, Ori. I just have a quick question, which is that I guess my thinking about this is that it just happens that there is a an antibody that is reactive against some antigen one that whole, happens to cross react with the NMDA receptor. It's not like, for example, in uh, an ovarian tumor that there are all of a sudden NMDA receptors expressed, but that it's essentially like a cross reactivity and it's an accident that they also react with NMDA receptors. Um, I, I mean, I think oftentimes you do get misexpression of proteins that are not mm. normally expressed. Um, and that's, I mean, that's, and that's diagnostic of some of these tumors as well, where there's a, you know, the, the gene expression pattern is very specific to that cancer, but they're making things mm-hmm. that oftentimes you wouldn't make in, in that cell type. Um, and, but then, you know, these cancers can evolve and at some point they, they make a whole bunch of things. Um, so I think it's both. I think it's both that you can get misexpression of the protein as well as just generation of antibodies that may be reactive. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say two things. One is a question, but the first is there is um, a fairly recent paper showing um, cells inside of uh, prostate tumors that express markers for neural stem cells. And I think in the paper, they actually show that it's... Um, I don't know if it was only this and they could rule out this misexpression, but there was definitely migration of cells from the central nervous system into the prostate tumor. So Mm -hmm. I think, you know, it is possible like you were, you know, with the ovarian cancer um, example, 
you know, you can't rule out the possibility that cells that are not supposed to be there somehow being recruited or like Jason was saying, being transformed. Um, and and sometimes other- you get, get like these, these uh, uh, pictures of tumors where there's like teeth growing and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So yeah, it like can happen. Thomas. It can yeah. definitely happen. My, <laughs> um, my mom is a pediatrician and she saw this kid who came into her office with like early morning vomiting and did an eye exam and had papilledema, so increased intracranial pressure, and she sent him to the hospital. And he had a teratoma in his cerebellum that had like teeth in it and hair and like is the craziest thing. Oh I've my ever gosh. Seen. Isn't yeah. it true that sometimes there's also nerves that can form like a pacemaker hooked up to the teeth so it just starts chattering? <laughs> Are mean, you I'm joking? Not, I, might have, I might have just dreamt that. Never mind. <laughs> Um, I had another question, actually, several times it has come up that like, you know, the NMDA receptor being a receptor on the outside of the cell would be an easy place for a T cell or B cell to come into contact with. But um, it's my understanding that they're generally not lymphocytes just traversing through the like parenchyma of the brain. Like there definitely are circulating immune cells sort of like nearby but so how would do the t cells or b is there are is there some sort of um blood brain barrier um so leakage of some sort or so permeability in, so in lupus there is good data for blood brain barrier permeability um but i kind of was always under the impression that these were b and t cells that were exposed to antigens like outside the CNS and then migrated in once blood brain barrier permeability happened. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they essentially react with the nervous system with once the blood brain barrier is permeable. I mean, there's definitely mm-hmm. evidence that the antibodies themselves can somehow get into the brain. And I think this is a big question in this field, which is where whether um, the antibodies themselves are binding mm-hmm. proteins in the brain and affecting their function because they're interfering with them versus just having inflammation and antibodies generally just getting into the, the, um, the brain and, and, and messing things up. But I would, you know, I'd say a lot of these neurological syndromes are very specific in that the phenotypes are, are quite um, you know, stereotyped, which suggests probably that there could be some interference with the normal function of these proteins. Mm. And What's right. And so what's particularly interesting is that eat right, even though these NMDA receptors are expressed throughout the nervous system, you can have brain region specific effects, I think is what Jason mm-hmm. is getting at. And that suggests that there might be either like some sort of direct agonism or in this case, allosteric modulation of the channel. Um, do they do patients? Uh, sorry, one more thing. Uh, do these patients like, I mean, uh, I guess, if they collect brain tissue afterwards, uh, after death, do they see gliosis of any kind? Yeah. So let's, we can talk a little bit about kind of the specific, like the human studies and Mm. um, in lupus in a second. Um, But Vincent, do you have a question about kind of auto antibody generation? This is something that happens during fetal development, right? When in the developing thymus, all the supposedly all the antigens are displayed, and any T cells that display them are killed, but some always squeak through, right? And that's the basis of autoimmunity. Yeah, except except I think the difference. The other thing is like in cancer models, there are neo antigens that are formed, right? That are not right, right. present in the thymus. So the, those okay. are generally yeah. like post translationally modified proteins that then escaped immune tolerance in the thymus, but they are present in in the tumor itself. And there's yeah, yeah. there's some idea that new antigens are present in neurodegenerative disease, and that that's what causes kind of autoreactive T cells or, um, or antibodies to to lead to neurodegeneration as well. And okay. also, wouldn't you predict that if it's your your own body failing to get rid of um, self recognizing um, T cells or B cells during development? wouldn't lupus happen a lot more in children? Right. So it's, so there, that is, seems like uh, an effect of hormones as well. Like mm-hmm. that there's, ah. so, there's an interaction of essentially like puberty and uh, like an estrogen that then leads to changes in kind of immune repertoire and maturation of B cells as well. And also some sort of environmental triggers as well, right? I think that's, that's, this was always this sort of uh, conversation going on about modern society and whether we 
um, are, are increasing autoimmune disorders because we're too clean and we're not, you know, inducing our immune response. I don't, I don't, I don't know if any of that is actually true, but, um, but there is talk about that. Mm -hmm. I guess we'll see after uh, we have been wiping down stuff during COVID. Yeah, that's how, yeah, that'll be interesting study. Yeah. Well, you, well, you get these, um, you keep on getting these conspiracy theories about how we're, we're just letting the virus evolve now because we're, we're too, you know, we're, um, we're cleaning off all these things and now we're not being exposed to natural immunogenic things. <laughs> Uh, it's, that's that's quite nonsense, as you know, because yep. we're getting exposed no, no. to plenty of stuff still. So we're. Kids. Oh, I know, I know. Yeah, especially the ivermectin I have over here. Oh well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's not so, go there. To bring it back, so um, so in lupus, um, so what are what is the human pathology and human imaging data show, Vivian? So that's that's a great question. Mm -hmm. So, um, there are two things that they show. So one is something called lupus cerebritis, which is an acute inflammatory syndrome of the brain, and I don't want to talk about that today um, because I think that that is kind of a separate clinical entity. Um, but instead, what we'll focus on is long-term hippocampal atrophy that they see in these patients. So if you image patients using MRI or both like functional MRI or structural um, imaging modalities, you can actually see changes in connectivity and hippocampal volume in um, in brains of people with lupus. And this can happen like year after years of having the disease essentially. So the idea that I have in my mind is although lupus is associated with these acute flares like lupus cerebritis or lupus nephritis, there's also this long-term low level kind of slow burn of inflammation that affects, that leads to neuropathology. And there have been two ideas of what leads to the neuropathology in lupus. So one is increased systemic inflammation um, and these are kind of just like circulating cytokines, like interferons and interleukins that then lead to just essentially uh, increased complement activation and dendritic atrophy um, and increased microglial activation. Um, and then there's a second kind of school of thought that there are specific pathogenic antibodies in lupus that enter the brain when the blood-brain barrier becomes permeable um, and then activate specific receptors on neurons and lead to circuit dysfunction and then eventually kind of excitotoxicity and cell death. Um, and the paper we will uh, discuss today, which I will find the title for here, um, is uh, from a, a really, really interesting kind of neuroscience institute on Long Island associated with Northwell Health in Stony Brook. Um, and the paper is called Lupus Autoantibodies Act as Positive Allosteric Modulators at GLU-N2A containing NMDA receptors and impaired spatial memory. And um, the first authors are Kelvin Chan, Jacqueline Nestor, um, and the last authors are Betty Diamond and Lonnie Walmuth. And I was, um, this kind of set of papers was brought to my attention at a really interesting Keystone meeting that I think that you presented at Jason um, over the summer that Betty Diamond gave this phenomenal talk at um, about neuropsych disorders in lupus. Um, and the moral of this paper, the takeaway from this paper is that anti autoantibodies in lupus actually act as positive allosteric modulators of NMDA receptors in the hippocampus. And that leads to excitotoxicity and altered kind of neural signaling and neurotransmission. Um, and so how do, how do they address this? Um, so, and I think that this is just super cool. So they um, had a patient with lupus and they cloned individual B cells and they found a B cell clone that produced antibodies that were autoreactive against um, the NMDA receptor. Um, and then they have a B cell clone that was making an antibody that was not reactive, not only with the NMDA receptor, but also not reactive um, with anything in the CNS. Um, and they do these experiments and I kind of went back and was like, okay, how do they even show this? Right. So they can do this in a couple of ways. One is they take a brain lysate and they run it on a Western blot and then use the antibody made by these B cells as kind of their primary antibody. And they can see either some bands or no bands. Or you can actually do immunofluorescence and take tissue sections either from mouse brain or human brain and look for a reactivity with these antibodies. Um, and, and for the non aficionados, those are, you know, uh, benchwork kind of experiments that are routinely done in our labs. And Western blot's just basically grinding up cells, 
and then having it run on a, a gel that is separating proteins by size and charge. And, um, and then you add your antibody and the antibody can then bind to that particular protein and you can visualize it. So it's a really sort of basic and bread and butter technique. And then obviously immunofluorescence is similar in that you bind, um, you have your antibody that binds to the protein, but this is now in tissue in a, in a cell and you can stain it. Um, and so you can visualize uh, where that protein is. Right, and be in, look at it in a cell specific way, which is always the problem with Western blots. And for example, you know, a lot of other techniques that are use bulk processing is that it doesn't give you any cell type specific resolution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All and, right. So yeah, go ahead. So a quick question. So you mentioned there are two types of antibodies they got from patients. One reacts with brain stuff, and the other doesn't react with brain stuff. So the ones that doesn't react does not react with brain stuff. Presumably, still reacts with something in the periphery and cause damage there it just and cause symptoms there but just doesn't go to the brain is that am i thinking and therefore it's a control for brain stuff yeah and i think that what they're controlling for is just having antibody there and whatever happens mm -hmm. with extra antibody and either immune activation or deposition of complement or et cetera, et cetera, essentially mm -hmm. um, but they're not having kind of the um the specific antigen antibody interaction that they're looking at and so it also suggests that uh, lupus is not caused by some tissue malexpression, malexpressing NMDA receptors, because you would then only have antibodies against NMDA receptors, but it's probably reacting against a broad range of stuff and have a bunch of different antibodies. Is that correct? Right. And I think, and to just emphasize that point is that these are actually autoantibodies that are originally thought to be anti -DN, double stranded DNA antibodies. Mm. So. So when you when you diagnose someone with uh, with lupus, you actually look for autoantibodies in their blood against uh, nuclei and double stranded DNA, um, and it just so happens that these double stranded DNA antibodies also have cross reactivity with NMDA receptors. Um, How does and, that work? Well, <laughs> it's interesting. There is a specific. So they go into this a little bit in the paper. There's a specific uh, five amino acid epitope that actually, when like linked in some way mimics the structure of double stranded DNA. Hmm. Fascinating. Yeah. So Ori, does any given lupus patient have antibodies that react with a wide range of tissues as they, they suggest here, or do you typically have just a few? Um, so clinically, we don't look, for example, we don't look at the variety of different antibodies. Mm -hmm. um, what we see is essentially you can track levels of in these particular antibodies, so anti-double stranded DNA or anti-rho and anti-la or anti-nuclear antigen, um, and you, essentially the level of circulating autoantibodies correlates with disease activity. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this is obviously a very kind of unique system. So they're taking just the purified antibody from a B cell clone from a single patient. Um, but then they ask the question of, okay, this is an antibody that interacts with NMDA receptors or the brain in general, and what is the direct mechanism of this antibody and how could it lead to circuit dysfunction? Okay. And from previous work, they knew that, um, that these antibodies reacted with NMDA receptors. So Jason, do you want to, can I put you on the spot? Can you, <laughs> can you give a 30 second background on kind of the structure and function of NMDA receptors? And this is something that we've talked about before on different podcasts. So it'd yep. be good to kind of have a space learning. Sure. So, um, these are receptors on neurons that are, um, they're of course neurotransmitters and there's neurotransmitter receptors. This is a neurotransmitter receptor that, um, is gated or activated by glutamate, which is the main excitatory neurotransmitter. So this is a very, um, predominant uh, uh, neurotransmitter receptor. So the other kind of neurotransmitter that's in excitatory neurons is called the AMP receptors, but both are gated by glutamate. But the NMDA receptor is sort of a very interesting receptor because it's both gated by glutamate. So that has to activate um, the, the receptor. And then you also have voltage sensitivity. So the uh, neuron has to have electrical activity so that it's depolarized and only when you get depolarization and glutamate being uh, bound to the receptor, you get the channel to open. And when it is open, it's, it's actually permeable for both sodium and calcium. And it's really the calcium that's, that makes this, this receptor very important because uh, in cells, you have a ton of calcium dependent second messenger cascades, signaling cascades that 
uh, affect the cell. So the NMDA receptor is really key for many of the sort of long-term effects that you have um, in response to experience, synaptic plasticity, that sort of thing, because it gates this calcium um, and so it can trigger these second messenger cascades. And so for learning and memory, we know that most of the um, uh, basically making memories requires these NMDA receptors. And it's the same for long-term potentiation, which we had discussed, which is one of the major forms of synaptic plasticity. The most common way to, to initiate that is through the NMDA receptor and these calcium uh, transients. And to get into the to get into the weeds just a bit more is that the NMDA receptor actually has four parts of it that form the final channel, um, and two of these parts are made up of something called NR1, and then there's a mix of different uh, like other subunits for the other two, so they can be NR2A, NR2B, and NR2C, and these different types of subunits confer the essentially the properties of the channel. So the calcium act the calcium entry, the half-life of opening and closing, et cetera. Um, isn't, there and, a, isn't there another class? NR3, but, right? Which totally changes how the channel functions. And it's like I think expressed like mostly in the cerebellum or it's a weird it, yeah, it's a it's, weird it's, one. It's, yeah. not it's, as, it's not as common. Um, but the NR, NR1 is the you actually, you absolutely need the NR1 and that forms the backbone and then the NR2 can switch in and out. And the two variants, the main, the main variants, especially in the hippocampus, the A or B, um, there's an expression pattern that changes over development so that you have one that switches to the other. Um, and so during developments, B, I think, and then it gets to A. Um, but they're both expressed, you know, pr predominantly in the hippocampus. And that, that's quite interesting that you mentioned that because um, what we'll see here is that GLU-N2A is the, really the target of these autoantibodies and it's expressed mostly later in life, right? After development. So suggesting that these autoantibodies, even if they're around early in life, may actually affect hippocampal function later in life because of intrinsic expression changes in the NR, in the NR subunits. Right. Although I'd say in humans, not exactly clear how, um, how what that profile looks like, but but at least in, in, in most um, animal studies we've done, uh, that tr that switch is quite a dramatic one after development. And also, especially in hippocampus, like there, mm -hmm. there's very little known about outside of hippocampus and cortex, what that switch is. Yep. Um, so what they do is they they take advantage of the fact that these the molecular basis of these channels has been really well studied, and they express different subtypes of NMDA receptors in heterologous cells. And so in these cells, they don't have many ion channels, but they just express the glu N, glu N1, the glu N2A, and, um, and, or N2B. And then they can do electrophysiologic recordings of these cells and measure the activity of the channel. And they know exactly what channel they're recording from because it's the only channel that they've expressed. Okay. And then you can ask the question, if you add the antibody, to these heterologous expression systems, do you get more activity of the NMDA receptor that you're expressing? And they see a very specific effect on GLUN2A compared to GLUN2B. Um, and this is really shown very nicely in figure one, where if they have cells that are expressing GLUN1 plus GLUN2A, so you have two of N1 and two of N2A, this adding the lupus autoantibody increases the NMDA receptor current, whereas it does, has no effect if glu N2B is expressed. Corey, can you just touch real quick for those of us or the listeners who are not that, you know, it's been a long time since we've talked about um, agonists and antagonists and if it's competitive or allosteric or anything like that, kind of like what what do those mean? Yeah, awesome. after, after a year of COVID, when you say antibody, I think neutralizing antibody that mm. should stop things from <laughs> yeah. working. And here, this is an antibody that does the opposite. Right. So I guess the way I think about this is that antibodies binding to something could have two different effects. One would be mm -hmm. directly modulating the antigen or the channel itself, or the second could be leading to other th leading other things to bind. So for example, in the FC, this constant region of the antibody, you can have complement activation or opsonization, but what they're actually looking at here is direct modulation of the antigen itself by binding to the antibody. And um, so in, let's take a step back to pharmacology, right? So when you have a drug, 
It could increase the activity of a protein, it could decrease the activity of a protein, or it could affect the interaction of a, a protein with its cognate ligand. Um, and in this case, what we know, what Jason explained to us was that glutamate is required, leads to opening of NMDA receptors and sodium and calcium entry into the cell, okay? What they show here is that if you add glutamate and you also have the autoantibody, glutamate's effect is increased, okay? Mm -hmm. And that suggests that this is an allosteric modulator. So it is, it's not that the antibody itself leads to channel opening, but the channel is opened more in the presence of the autoantibody. And is it, is it, does it change like some specific, like the size of the channel pore or the probability of opening or anything like that? Like great, great question. So that, huh. so, so, um, you can actually do this in like, these are crazy experiments that I remember reading, like learning about early in my PhD and thinking that this is insane that you can do this, but you can put a patch pipette onto a cell and pull it back and essentially take a piece of membrane that's so small that it only has a single channel in it. Okay. And then what you get is current flow through this piece of membrane that is essentially on or off it's binary. Okay. And when you add an antibody or when you add any type of pharmacologic tool, so any, an agonist, an antagonist, glutamate, for example, to the bath surrounding this membrane, you can see that the channel will either open more or stay open for longer or have more flow through it, okay? And what they showed, this is now, I believe, figure two, um, is that essentially adding the autoantibody leads to an increased number of openings, but not the amount of time that the channel is opening. So. If you think about it this way, the channel is sitting there with glutamate, it has some spontaneous ability to open in the presence of glutamate, and it's more likely to do so when the antibody is there as well. But once it's open, it will close with the same frequency. Um, and that's actually quite interesting kind of mechanistically and gets at what the antibody is doing to the channel itself. Or I have a, a topology question. Yeah. So where are the antibodies on the outer face? the plasma membrane or the inner face? And if, okay, if so they're you, on the outer face, how do you get them there? <laughs> so you can do this in a number of different ways. Like you can essentially take just a piece of the membrane and then you essentially have, so you have your pipette, right? And you can have the antibody, you can have the outside of the membrane on the inside of the pipette, or you can mm -hmm. do the outside on the outside. I think in this case, what they actually do is they have the antibody inside the pipette so the outside of the membrane is inside the pipette and then is exposed to glutamate and antibody inside the pipette itself. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the glutamate binding spot is on the outside, of course, mm -hmm. uh, and that's how the glutamate can access it without having to get inside the cell. And a lot of the, um, all, almost all the drugs that we know of that affect these receptors can are binding on the outside, not the inside. But the inside, there is a, a C-terminal tail and that's, that is complicated because it interacts with a bunch of proteins at the synapse uh, mm. to localize them to and and they can affect the pore opening and other sort of gating properties like there's a whole bunch of phosphorylation events but but yeah most of the the action does happen on the outside so is there a refractory period like there's a period after the channel opens and then closes where like generally where it can't open again right or is no, that maybe not with NMDA receptors? Not necessarily. I okay. mean, you're thinking of the sodium channels, which do have a refractory period. The NMDA receptors, in general, it's it's all about whether the glutamate is bound and whether, and then there's also coagonists. So there's glycine that can also bind, which is you know another neurotransmitter. So it's it's complicated. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, I was just trying to kind of like think about how the what the antibody would be doing to like this. I guess, structure of the protein to- well, the, the opening is still stochastic in some way. So even when you have glutamate bound, if you were able to sample um, when the pore is open, it's open and closing very quickly. And and there are some, so you can, you can sensitize the receptor and you can desensitize it so that, um, you know, when something's bound to it, 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 it won't, um, it won't actually uh, open when you have glutamate. So it's, it's definitely, yeah, I mean, they go into some of that in, in this paper as well, exactly mm -hmm. what the antibody is doing. Um, and I think that, mm. I think that one interesting point here is that the, that everything is kind of an equilibrium that, 
that there is just a stochastic nature that is biased by the presence or absence of glutamate or the autoantibody. And it's not that every time there's an antibody present, the channel opens and kind of, it just is biasing this equilibrium one way or the other. Um, so the next set of experiments they do is it gets a little bit into the weeds and I will brush over them with a high level picture, but I think they're actually very beautiful experiments. Um, and that is that, as I mentioned before, that the NMDA receptor has four sub sub parts, right? So you have two that have to be N1 and then the other two could be 2A, can be two 2As, they can be two 2Bs or they can be a 2A and a 2B. And one question is, is it just, do, do you need both to be 2A to, for the autoantibody to have an effect? And they go back to their cell system and they express channels where you have two N1s and then any of the combinations of 2A and 2B as the other two subunits. And they show that a single copy of 2A is sufficient to allow the an autoantibody to affect channel function. And then the second really nice experiment that they do is that they make mutant channels that where this five amino acid sequence that I mentioned before is the antigen is where the antibody binds. They mutate one amino acid to a different charge. And what they see is that the channel itself is not affected by this mutation, but it now is resistant to the effect of the autoantibody. Okay. So that just essentially shows that this is a true kind of biological interaction, that there is a direct binding of the antibody to the antigen. Um, and is just one of kind of these elegant experiments in, in biology that you can do. Okay. All right, Laurie, go, go, go question. Ahead. Yeah, go, go. So, so they showed that, um, so by doing so, they showed that they can mutate a residual on the N2A subunit and the, and the antibody that is acting as a modulator to increase glutamate opening of the channel. That doesn't bind and all these effects goes away. Um, in a parallel set of experiment, you also just, I can't remember whether you discussed, but the authors found if you do the same thing with and glue N2B subunit, very little happens. So this antibody doesn't uh, act as a positive allosteric modulator uh, on the glue N2B subunit. Is it because it doesn't bind as well? Um, or is it actually, it still binds, but doesn't act as a, a modulator? So I don't think they addressed that directly in this paper, but in previous papers that had been shown that there is, it had been shown that there were binding to both NMDA receptors. And that's what this paper, I think really adds to the literature is that they take, they take all these observations and apply them to functional assays of the channel itself, as opposed to just binding. Yeah, in fact, in the, in the paper there, um, they say that the binding properties, the intrinsic binding of gluin 2A and gluin 2B is the same. So, so they suggest that the sensitivity is, is, is all about the gating um, and you know the structural change that's happened when there is binding. Um, and for whatever reason, it, the gluin 2A is just more sensitive to that. Cool, that's interesting. Thank you. Um, so, so why does this all matter? Um, so I guess some could say that it doesn't really matter, but I think that the, that uh, the the point of this is that now we know the molecular target for these autoantibodies. So if we could inhibit glu N two A, for example, then the effect of the autoantibody on the neural circuitry could be mitigated, and you could actually have a treatment for neuropsychiatric symptoms in lupus. Um, and before this paper, we didn't know what the true molecular target was. So we could have used drugs that inhibit glue N2A or glue N2B or glue N1, and we would never have known. But by actually using kind of these molecular tools, we now have targets. And luckily, there are existing pharmacal, there are existing drugs that target these specific subunits of NMDA receptors. And in figure 3F, what they, they use an assay, um, which is a essentially a cell death assay. And the reason that this is important is that increasing NMDA opening leads to calcium entry. And there's an idea in neuroscience that calcium entry through NMDA receptors leads to cell death and through a process called excitotoxicity. Um, and this in, in lupus is important because when the autoantibody, what we know is that autoantibody binding to neurons through the NMDA receptor actually leads to cell death. And that's where we get the atrophy of the hippocampus that we talked about earlier, Vivian. So 
um, in this assay, what they did was they added the autoantibody and then they also blocked GLUN2B or GLUN2A. And they showed that the cell death that the autoantibody generates is actually blocked by inhibitors of GLUN2A. So that suggests that possibly one of the mechanisms that leads to cell death and hippocampal atrophy in lupus could be blocked by essentially a pharmacologic compound. Are those drugs used for other things just like now? Because I, when I think about inhibiting NMDA receptors, that just doesn't sound like it would be a great thing to do. Yeah, there's, you don't want to you don't want to block the the whole receptor, um, but there are even drugs on on the, in the that are used in the clinic that modulate NMDA receptors. So memantine, which is one of the few uh, drugs that are approved for Alzheimer's disease. Um, is an NMDA agonist, but of course, there's also the main one of the main ones that are sort of discussed right now is ketamine, right. um, and ketamine can potently block NM NMDA receptor um, function, but it's the dose response curve is quite different depending on what kind of um, you know receptor subtype and all that. But I guess you could imagine a a dose response curve where you have essentially at a certain dose of the drug, it should only affect it should have, it should be it should be able to mitigate increased opening of NMDA receptors in a lupus patient without really affecting kind of the normal opening that you see in in a normal patient. Mm -hmm. So are have, these are the antibodies constantly present at a high level or at some level, or I mean, because you know immune responses always wane, right? Right, <laughs> as we have learned, and so you get a vaccine and you have very low antibody levels in the blood, so. Is it abnormally high antibody levels in these patients or their intermittent production and binding? I mean, that would all dictate how you would treat them as well, right? Mm -hmm. Of course. And I, and I think that to take a step back, it's very hard to measure that directly, right? Because we unfortunately, well, fortunately, we can't take the hippocampus of a lupus patient and grind it up and look for the level of the antibody. So we're always looking at biomarkers either in the CSF or in the serum um, for levels of the antibody itself. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the the predominant thinking is that these are flares, that there essentially is a period of time where there's some trigger that leads both to increased antibody production and increased blood brain barrier permeability and increased then crossing of the antibody into the hippocampus. Uh, why don't we just crisper out the antibody gene? Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm wouldn't sort, that, sort of, I feel like that's going to be all, all of them. No, yeah, just the like, one. Just how are you going to do that? <laughs> I don't know. We can figure it out. We Bone can, you take everything out, irradiate them, treat their no, cells, no. and then it's put quite them out. difficult well, because of the because of the combinatorial right. nature of it, and you like it's going to affect. It's very difficult to get well, just one. Well, this may be a germline encoded antibody, right? Highly rearranged already. There are you know there are some that are uh, there, highly rearranged, and you can recognize them as being antigen specific already. So if that's the case with this. Uh, that I don't know, but I, I know that B cell depletion, like agents like rituximab, and I don't yeah, think actually rituximab yeah. works in lupus, but there are other essentially monoclonal antibodies that target different B cell expressing or mm -hmm. essentially signaling pathways on B cells that lead to B cell activation and maturation that are used in lupus and have really good efficacy. You could target this antibody on B cells, right? You could make an antibody to this antibody. And, the, again, but it, that goes back to the question of like, how uniform are these antibodies yeah, that are formed, sure. right? And, and does yeah. any individual patient have, as you mentioned earlier, like a variety of antibodies that have yeah, yeah. a variety of antigen specificity that happen to maybe converge on NMDA receptors or not, right? Um, so we can just get to the last kind of the last set of experiments, which I thought were very nice. Um, and in these experiments, what they do is they essentially generate NMDA receptor subunit knockouts. So either NR2A knockouts or NR2B knockouts. Mm -hmm. And then they do this experiment where they have kind of an immunization where they get these mice to have levels of the autoantibody in circulating. They give a stimulus to make the blood-brain barrier permeable and they see the effects on the hippocampus in this case. And what they see is that the NR NR2A subunit is required for microgliosis and dendritic atrophy, and then also behavioral effects of these autoantibodies in vivo. Um, and so they really go kind of from isolated cell cultures and cancer cell lines all the way to the intact mouse in this paper 
and show that their mechanism truly works here and that this seems to be kind of a unifying mechanism based on the evidence that they have. Yeah, they measured um, things like hippocampal place fields and stuff and um, and also like how well our mouse can recognize, um, you know, an object that has been moved from a previous position. Um, and the authors utilized uh, knocking out of these NR2A versus NR2B subunits. And um, I was wondering whether just knocking them out, uh, oh, and then looked at what happens when you trigger this immune response by giving this antibody that is going to, you know, affect hippocampal function. But I was wondering whether just knocking out these anti uh, these N NMDA receptor subunit itself is going to cause some defects in all these behavior. Well, you, and you notice that in most of these figures, they don't have a wild type control, right? So that, that would have been really nice to see. And I actually don't know that maybe they have it in the supplement, but it would have been really nice to see wild type mouse plus, plus antibody or wild type mouse plus vehicle control compared to the, not the NR2A or NR2B knockouts. Yeah, I agree. I, there, there are very well, um, stud, these are probably the, the most studied, um, receptors in neuroscience. And there's plenty of papers showing that, that if you, that these knockouts do have issues. Um, but um, I mean, at least they show that an antibody specific effect and um, it'd be nice to see the, the baseline, but you know, yeah. Ori, can you talk about, so I, I didn't get to look further at what I assume is in the supplement based on what Tim said, but they used the localization task or like noticing whether or not an object has moved, right? So the paradigm there is that the mouse can see like one or two objects and learns them to be in a particular place. And then when they're, then they get tested again and one of the objects or the only object that was there is then moved to a new place and it should increase the amount of time that they spend looking at that object. Is that what yeah. they did here? So why, and like there are other assays that would test like just the ability to recognize that it's a novel object. I'm just interested by there's the specificity of this, that like it's spatial mm. memory. Yeah. So that, mm. that gets back at what is kind of the neuropsychiatric syndrome in these patients. Um, and I think like the psych, like the neuropsychiatric kind of, so if you think about it, you know, we have different cognitive processes happen at once. So we have spatial memory, we have attention, we have kind of uh, implicit and explicit memory. And, and um, I actually, from my reading, it seems like there's just kind of this like global dysfunction across like that is not domain specific um, in patients with lupus. And in some papers, they actually describe it as kind of a brain fog, which I didn't particularly love. But they 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 essentially seem to be like that it's not that it's domain agnostic that it's across many different domains um in these mice they they use a trick to get a specifically a hippocampal pathology um and i don't really know what the ba i've like i never heard of this before um but essentially they permeabilize the blood brain blood brain barrier by causing transient inflammation by giving lps so that's essentially like a piece of the of a bacterial cell wall that leads to this systemic inflammation and the systemic inflammation leads to probably endothelial cell dysfunction and blood brain barrier permeability. Um, and for some reason that is specific to the hippocampus, which I had actually, I never heard before. Um, and there are right. other papers that have done similar types of experiments using a different trigger um, that lead to just blood brain barrier breakdown in the amygdala and they see different behavioral outcomes. Um, so the it's actually a consequence of the way that they developed the model as opposed to having any necessarily relevance to human subjects. Yeah. So if they had done something that was not hippocampal specific, their mice would have brain fog. Yeah, I guess that that's, yeah. <laughs> okay. So are these are monoclonals. Is that correct? Uh, I actually don't. Yeah. I think that they're monoclonal because they're from a B cell clone, right? They're from a single B cell. Okay. And they're, but they recognize DNA as well as these, subunits right right sure yeah and uh, are th is there more than I mean, you you mentioned you know you can change one amino acid and it disrupts binding but is there presumably there's a variety of such antibodies made in patients right yeah so the yeah so i guess like what is you know is, is does this mouse model have any relevance to human lupus in the sense that there's probably many different monoclonals and certainly polyclonal yeah, res yeah this polyclonal response right and that i don't know I, mean, so, I think obviously there's a lot, a lot of work to be done here, and this is kind of 
initiating it because of this antibody observation. But that's that's an interesting question. Could there be more than one type of uh, monoclonal, more than one epitope on the receptors, right, that could do this as well? Yeah, it would have been interesting to see them try to generalize a little bit, at least especially in the cell culture experiments, which are like yeah. fairly easy. All you have to do is get a bunch of B cell clones or even just take right. total B cells from these patients and try to work it out that way. But I think that they were more interested in the antigen. And I guess your point is, how do we know that this is relevant to general lupus? Yeah. I mean, they presumably they pull out B cells and then screen in some way for reactivity with DNA, right? That would be the primary screen. I, but I think that in this case, there's also a further, like a secondary screen for CNS reactivity, right? Okay, right. And that's yeah. where they picked up the, the glutamate, yeah. And, huh. and then this antibody in particular is known to cause excitotoxicity, and then they do, then they kind of got to the subunit specificity in this paper. But presumably, I mean, this is also why I think lupus is such a diverse, I mean, people present with such diverse symptoms because the mm. antibody repertoire is, is going to, is, is sort of a, a miss, you know, mix of things. Um, there's certainly other disorders where it, it's clear it's only an NMDA receptor antibody mm -hmm. and you get encephalitis and it can, you know, it, it's it's quite severe. Um, but this is interesting in that it sort of does tie back to a very common, I mean, lupus is pretty common. Actually, ooh, after you, Laurie, I've got Go a quick question. So it depends on whether you're going. I on. was just going to follow up what Jason said, which is that I think that that's a good point is like, if this were the only mechanism of CNS dysfunction in lupus, then why don't patients with lupus have an MDA receptor encephalitis, right? Mm -hmm. That, that mm -hmm. inherently, this inherently invokes mm -hmm. other mechanisms for neuropsychiatric symptoms, right? Yeah, I think in the discussion, they mentioned that anti-NMDA encephalitis is, is via a different mechanism. Um, oh yeah, causes chronic NMDA receptor hypofunction. So it does a different thing. Mm. Um, yeah, I was going to ask I'm, earlier I'm kind of how they just pirating displace the interaction of NMDA receptor with synaptic proteins such as the Efren B receptor. So, so what I just mm. mentioned is actually a, a completely different disease um, called NMDA anti NMDA encephalitis. Please correct me if I'm wrong because I've just kind of read it in the last two minutes. Um, and this is also the body for some reason. Um, I'm guess it, I'm guessing it could be cancer. Um, making some autoantibody that but also binds to the NMDA receptors and causes a different set of um, symptoms. Um, so actually, my question is based on that, which is um, how come I've only heard of two autoimmune disease that affects the brain and both of them targets the NMDA receptors. Um, is it the NMDA receptors are especially easy to be targeted by antibodies or, or NMDA receptor dysfunction is the easiest to be detected by a well, doctor. Don't, don't forget multiple sclerosis. That's also a very common autoimmune disorder that doesn't involve NMD receptors. Ah, but does it involve anti? Is it the antibodies that? Yes. Is the, ah, okay. Yes. Okay. Yes, those a lot of patients. Uh, I mean, it's similar to lupus, and uh, from what I've gathered, just based on our conversation here, that's not all patients with MS will have the antibodies, but a fair amount of them do, and they tend to be like. Um, antibodies targeted, targeted toward um, proteins that are present in high concentrations in myelin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think it comes down again to that, potentially to the just concentration of the antigen. Mm -hmm. So like, and that could be why maybe they're like, Ori said earlier, region specific effects because the NMDA receptors are more concentrated in particular regions of the brain. Yeah, and I think mm -hmm. overall the NMDA receptors are one of the most predominant proteins at synapses, even more so potentially than the amprotype glutamate receptors, which you absolutely require. So I think it's it's both a protein concentration and antibody concentration issue. Um, and the fact that the, these receptors are so important for many different kinds of brain function, um, they're just, you're just overtly gonna see a lot of um, presentations, clinical presentations, I would guess, because of that. Um, as opposed to perhaps that there's some mechanism that directs antibodies just to those receptors. I mean, and obviously in this case, it's sort of random that you you can have this binding, but you're only seeing a functional effect because these receptors are so important. 
I mean, yeah, there's a whole class of uh, paraneoplastic and en like encephalitis that act on potassium channels, for example. And those, so, and that, those affect different parts of the brain. So there's like ataxia, there can be seizures from that. So it, it is not necessarily specific to NMD or something. Yeah, it's just that those are rare. I mean, the same with these, P these PNMA genes, which are fairly common uh, in these paraneoplastic disorders, we know absolutely nothing about what they do in the brain, like zero, <laughs> which is fun for us as a lab to find, figure out. But in terms of what, why they're important, no idea. So my question though is, so eventually are we just going to find autoreactive antibodies in every psychiatric disorder? Like, is just a, this just the tip of the iceberg and that this is a general mechanism for neurologic or neuropsychiatric dysfunction? Or is it that we are seeing some, that these are just important because they're somewhat treatable, right? Is there a, um, you know, like lupus and like a lot of autoimmune diseases um, are present are more common in women, but is that the same for psychiatric disease? Yeah, but I think, yeah, I think that's where, yeah, I, I, I would say no. Yeah, that's what I was <laughs> um, going to say too. Some, some affect more than others. Yeah, uh, I think mood disorders probably, actually, I have no idea. But yeah. I was going to say potentially well, mood disorders would be more in female since we already know, you know, that we, we see every month how gene fluctuations and hormones are going to affect mood. But um, yeah, but there are a ton of other um, neurodegenerative and psychiatric diseases that don't have any obvious relationship to estrogen. There's definitely sex differences for sure. Um, and, and, and like prevalence. Hmm. Yeah, I think. Or in response to your suggestion, there's probably a lot of ways to screw up animals and organisms in general. So it's not just with antibodies, you know. Yeah. But I think there's a big component here. This is pretty exciting. I mean, this is a big deal, this paper, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, to me, it's it takes uh, this kind of general idea of neurologic dysfunction to mm -hmm. like a true target um, mm -hmm. in a very direct way that I had not appreciated before hearing um, Betty Diamond talk at the conference. But, but I would say, you know, going back to what um, Tim was uh, bringing up with the, the other mm -hmm. kind of encephalitis and what, they, what those antibodies are doing, there they're saying that those antibodies, you know, internalize the receptor. So you basically just lose the receptor. So you're sort of a loss of function. Mm -hmm. Whereas this is a real interesting, subtle effect. I mean, you know, it's not really interfering with, with the whole receptor. It's just gating it slightly. Um, and so, you know, that that and that sort of tuning one can imagine would result in psychiatric disorder yeah. versus when you just lose the receptor and then you're you're getting encephalitis and that's much more severe um change to the brain i would love to know how the astrocytes impact these synapses and if they can in some way like compensate for the increased opening of the channel or if they would actually like aggravate it in some way. And I imagine if you have these antibodies coming in, like, uh, I mean, at least the microglia are probably going to be. So I actually looked in, I, <clears throat> I actually looked into this because, uh -huh. um, uh, when I read this paper and I saw it's an antibody mediator thing, I kind of remembered in one of, uh, Vincent's sister podcast immune, one of the earlier episodes, they actually talked about a paper where uh, microglia and the complement pathway actually mediate some of the pathology of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and uh, Cindy on Immune presented it. And after she pre presented the data, um, the first question she asked was, um, the paper just showed that this complement pathway called C1Q is important for um, for synaptic loss and dendritic, pr dendritic pruning um, in Alzheimer's model. Um, but as an immunologist, the first thing she teaches for C1Q is that it requires an antibody for it to be activated. Mm. And she's like, well, where's the antibody? What is mm -hmm. going on? Mm -hmm. So when I read this paper, there's an antibody here. So I immediately thought, is this uh, is any of these pathology maybe involve the complement system? <laughs> so as it turns out, Betty Diamond already did that in a previous paper where she had a C1Q knockout and that blocked some of the pathology. It blocked the cell loss in the hippocampus, but very interestingly, it did not block the loss of dendrites. Mm -hmm. So it seems like the loss of dendrites, sorry, no, I got it yeah. wrong. I got it the Reverse, other way around. Yeah. 
uh, it blocked the loss of dendrites because that is thought to be mediated by um, uh, microglia engulfing, um, but it didn't block the uh, neuronal cell loss. So, which is um, which is interesting. Which is actually part of the reason why I asked uh, Jason whether it binds to uh, was Ori whether it binds to NR2B because if it doesn't bind to NR2B, it would explain why um, the antibody doesn't work. Uh, it, it, you can block the effect of dendritic pruning. But it's interesting that it still binds to NR2B, but as soon as you get rid of NR2A, um, you can block the dendritic pruning. So they actually sure. they actually do have an experiment in this paper that they looked at microglia and they were not activated by these mm. antibodies. Mm. Interesting. Um, mm. But you know the, the excited toxi toxicity idea for how um, cells die has been around for a long time, and, and in fact, drug companies inv invested billions of literally billions of dollars to, to have drugs because excited toxicity was you know sort of the idea of the endpoint for stroke for ischemia for neurodegenerative disorders and there is zero drugs out there that block excited toxicity that if, that actually alleviate these these diseases so uh, you know and whether that's because the drugs are just not good enough or if this is whole, whole idea is wrong it's not clear hmm. Yeah, or or if the treatment is at the wrong time, et cetera, right? Right, I mean, but that's yeah. just to say it's not been a successful strategy, and there's been, um, you know, the sort of tie into cell death from excited toxicity. There has been thousands of papers on it, but not a lot of translation uh, into the clinic. But I mean, you you've been around in this field for longer than I have, but I also feel like there there have been waves of excitement over prostate. Like, I feel like I started thinking about neurodegeneration at the end of the apoptosis wave. And before that, there was this excited toxicity wave. And like, yeah. and now we're moving forward to this prion wave. And I'm sure that there will be in the <laughs> well, next wave. Yeah. But the wave, the, it, that is exactly true in, in the academic realm. Um, mm -hmm. But part of that's because the, the translational um you know, efficacy is wasn't there. So if there were drugs that had succeeded with excited toxicity, I would say there'd still be a lot of excitement around learning more about it. But since it didn't, since it didn't happen, yeah, I think the money just dried up. So what's mm -hmm. the, so what, how do you fix that going forward? What, earlier translational testing or? Yeah, well, I mean, it goes back and it's similar to Alzheimer's, right? So it goes back to the idea, is it that the biology is not correct right. and we're targeting the wrong things? Or is it that the treatments themselves are not being given at the right time or the, 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 the treatments themselves are not as good as we think they are in terms of the target? So it's hard because so th these diseases are this have such a long um, progression, I think. But yeah, anyway, we're getting sidetracked. <laughs> <laughs> but that kind of points to this paper because this paper suggests that the if you block increased calcium in what well, at least nmda function um in in lupus you could potentially help but if if it does if with all these other diseases it suggests that it doesn't then it suggests that you know blocking nr2a for example it might be might might not work very well um i guess time will tell i'm guessing they'll develop drugs and test it out but yeah yeah, I, the, I, the, I imagine actually that there's a ton of those drugs out there that uh, that were dead ends for pipelines. So mm -hmm. you could certainly imagine that the drugs are, are there available to, to test some of these ideas. But, um, you know, I think I think here you can imagine the circuit dysfunction, brain dysfunction that doesn't even require um, cell death. So mm -hmm. um, so uh, it, it could work. Thanks for that, Ori. That was great. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Appreciate this was really fun. It. Thank you. Yeah. So was it lupus? It's never lupus. It's never lupus. <laughs> did, <laughs> they, the, the did they explicitly say that? Or is it yeah, just like something people noticed? No, then there was like, I remember there was like a meme that was a like, house was like, oh, it's never lupus. <laughs> That's because they always been trying for the most esoteric thing they can find. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. Or in so. your experience, has it ever been lupus? <laughs> I've seen two patients with lupus. In my oh, home. Okay. Well, Should... that's two more than zero. Yeah. <laughs> Should we have that as our title, episode title? It's never lupus. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> we grab all the house watchers, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. I would love to do some email, but I have to go. So next time we have some good ones. So next time, uh, let's leave a little time aside to read some of them because they're 
always good to hear from listeners, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is Twin 22. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash twin. If you want to send a question or a comment, twin at microbe.tv. If you really like what we do and you'd like to pay for part of this new studio here in New York City, uh, microbe.tv slash contribute. Ori Lieberman is at the University of California, San Francisco. Ori Lieberman on Twitter. Thanks, Ori. Thanks, Vincent, and congratulations on the studio. Oh, it's uh, going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it. Yep. Jason Shepard is at the University of Utah. He's Jason Synaptic on Twitter. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Vincent. Thanks, guys. Timothy Chung is at New York University, which is just cross town from me. I'm I'm about directly across from, I used to lecture there years ago. I used to take the train to Penn Station and walk across town. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Vincent. I'll come for your housewarming party when you throw one. You bet. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll have one for sure. Vivian Morrison's at Vanderbilt University. Thanks, Vivian. Thanks, guys. And Vincent Racaniello, you can find me at, you can find me at the Incubator. That's the name of this place on 7th Avenue or at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Neuroscience. Thanks for joining us. See you next time. Thank you.